Good morning. It's John Pollock and Waiting coming at you on Wednesday, literally one minute afternoon. Yeah, yeah. A good afternoon, I I suppose, at this point. Yeah, I don't I don't know when the full transition from good morning to good afternoon happens, but if we're going by the literal definition, it is now afternoon. It's for some people it's it's still in the morning. Those of you on the West Coast. Um we, we don't we don't constrict ourselves to think that everyone revolves around the eastern time zone no not at all um so this is actually kind of nice you know it is yeah got to watch the show last night uh uh, didn't have to rush right to go live uh we were able to maybe digest our meal maybe take a bit bit of a walk uh afterwards and then now we can Release. Yeah, Way Way and I went for a stroll across the the waterfront to reflect on Rampage and share our deepest thoughts, and mm-hmm. it was it was a wonderful evening. And then I got to ride shotgun as Way navigated downtown Toronto to try and get to Sneaky D's, and it was a uh, it was fun to watch you going through residential areas and realizing how many one ways there are. There are a lot of them in the city. Yeah, um, driving. Ulti- ultimately, though, I am glad I drove rather than um, take transit or uh, your original plan bike in minus two degree weather in in this awful awful march that we're going through yeah this feels later in the year that i don't necessarily usually the worst of it is january february and march especially by now this late into march is sort of a uh, a turnaround in weather but we're still waiting in 2024 for we we got a little reprieve it's been all- last week it's been all over the place, and I, I wonder when AEW decided to book a Toronto show in March if they were expecting, you know, a, li- a little bit of a calmer sort of um, more mild um, uh, temperatures. But no, it was pretty damn cold yesterday. Yeah, like we're, we're dealing in snow this week. Pretty much, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, we have a lot to discuss. As noted, we are doing this show on Thursday as opposed to Wednesday night because Wayne and I both took in the live experience of Dynamite and Rampage, so we, we will be going through all three hours of AEW programming from Wednesday night. But thank you to everyone for joining us at this uh, special time. And we are going to start off discussing the UFC settlement, at least pending settlement regarding its two antitrust cases. The first one uh, was filed by a group of fighters led by Kung Lee in 2014. And then a follow-up antitrust lawsuit that was filed by the likes of Cajun Johnson, CB Dalloway and others. And this The first suit covered fighters that had competed in the UFC from December of 2010 until the end of June 2017. The Cajun Johnson lawsuit covered fighters from that period in July 1st of 2017 onward. So I've seen the estimate that this roughly would equate to about 1,200 to 1,400 fighters. And the way this worked is that, I mean, if Wei and I had competed in the UFC you know, had uh, had made it all the way there to the UFC and we're in this class period. And we didn't even have any contact with any of the representatives here. We are entitled to the payout here. Mm-hmm. Way would have had, way or I would have physically had to withdraw ourselves from this class action suit to not be part of it. And what you had was no fighters opted out of this, including fighters that were going to testify on behalf of the UFC that did not opt out of the suit. So what we have is the announcement that came out through TKO on Wednesday that a tentative settlement has been reached for the figure of $335 million. This still needs to be approved by a judge, and this could take several months. And we don't know how this is going to be dispersed among the fighters in the two separate uh, lawsuits. We also don't know if this is solely financial. Are there any other, is there any injunctive relief baked into this that would have changes to the UFC contracts? None of that was mentioned. It doesn't mean that there is going to be further um, 
I guess I could call them penalties or at least changes. Um, all we know is th the monetary figure. And of course, when you see a figure like this and for the Kung Lee suit that dates back over nine years, um, I've seen estimates like the legal cost could be like 33% of this figure, which is no small amount that the lawyers will be getting from all of this. And then whatever the fighters get, the fighters are going to get something and it's not going to be an insignificant amount for them. But when you look at this, it seems like the general temperature I could sense was that people were looking at this to be a game changer for not just fighters in the past of being compensated, but for future fighters to be in better, better areas of protection when it comes to their status as whether they are independent contractors with the UFC, having the ability to have less, um, less structured contracts in the sense that the UFC has less of a clamp on your ability to move promotions and just a lot more rights for fighters going forward. There's no evidence of that. Nate Quarry, who was part of the Kung Lee suit, he did put out um, a, a statement on Instagram and he kind of outlined. And first of all, the, the, no one can really talk about this too in depth for the next period of time until this is all finalized. But the most we got here from Nate Quarry was, um, no, we didn't get everything we wanted. Our goal all along was to change the sport. However, we had quite a few delays and we had to deal with them. And to get injunctive relief, i.e. change the sport, we would have had to refile both lawsuits and combine them, go through discovery all over again, retake depositions, about a five-year delay, and then hope we get granted class action status again. We'd be looking at another 10 years just to be where we are today with no guarantee of winning any punitive amount of injunctive change. As I said, weighing all the possible outcomes, this seemed the best outcome. We're not high-fiving one another, but we are pleased that a lot of fighters are going to be getting some compensation for being underpaid. Wish we could have done more. Over time, I'll be able to speak more in depth about all of this, but for now, with apologies, this is about it. And so, I mean, I take from that that this is probably going to be limited to financial compensation, which again, I'm not going to downplay. And this figure is not, um, it's not on the high end of what was out there. Like we were talking about the potential of over a billion dollars being awarded, which in this kind of a suit could be treble damages, which means those could be tripled. Like we could have been talking multi-billions of dollars that AO and the UFC could be on the hook for. On the other side of things, they could have gone to trial and risked getting nothing. Like a judge could have ruled in the UFC's favor. Um, so it's the, the figure is $335 million, but it would seem overall that this was taken as a positive for the UFC that $335 million, it sounds like this is all going to be covered by insurance for them. The stock price went up a sizable margin. Um, if you tuned into uh, myself and Brandon Thurston, you will know Vince McMahon had a pretty profitable day on paper uh, as a result of this stock going up a, as well. So, but that, you know, brings an end, uh, barring any unforeseen ruling by a judge to these two antitrust cases and kind of the sport, I think is, you know, it's a financial, um, it's a, it's a, it's a sizable number that the UFC is forking over, but the, the DNA of the sport does not feel like it is changing. And I think for fighters, it is, you know, I wouldn't say life-changing money that they're going to be receiving out of this, but not insignificant money either. Is this the end of any follow-up potential suits? Uh, any threat of that for MMA based um, at the MMA side of things? And obviously the pro wrestling side of things is a different question. Yeah, they're both interesting cases. So the way the new UFC contracts are written, and I would encourage everyone to check out the interview we did with Eric McGraken, who's a, an attorney here in Canada. Uh, he was on with Brandon and I and has done a lot of great coverage of the story throughout the, the entire tenure of the case going back to 2014. But the, the UFC contracts, they have specific language now when it comes to participating in class action suits and the ability to um, try and limit these kinds of cases in the future. It doesn't preclude them from entering a antitrust suit in the future, but there, there are more um, there are more deterrents now. And I would just looking at this, I would think that 
this route is probably not going to be undertaken by any fighters for the foreseeable future. There is always the ability to try and push through the Ali Act, which applies to boxing, but not mixed martial arts. There is always the chance of fighters one day unionizing or forming an association. But I think that is something that is a far cry from where, like I brought this up on the interview with, with Eric on Wednesday, is the fact that this was a situation where these 12 to 1400 fighters they didn't have to do anything. They just had to sit back and your risk was that maybe you'll get nothing out of this, but you have to put nothing into this. And the upside is maybe I'm going to get a six figure check. And everyone knows you go to your mailbox and you find a check for $18,000. You're very happy that something like that would happen. And it's going to be way, way more than $18,000. I'm just taking that figure off the top of my head. But for something like an association, that is where you literally need fighters to step up and join something. And we saw with Leslie Smith's Project Spearhead. I mean, it just did not have the support of the significant amount of fighters. And I will always go back to different points in time where the fighters had the most leverage. And I think one of the key times, and this goes doubly so for pro wrestlers, was at the start of the pandemic. And these promotions were in fear of losing out on these television rights deals as the pandemic shut things down. They needed to produce this programming and they were at the mercy to have wrestlers and fighters that were going to be able to populate these cards. And if you had a sizable portion and of the main fighters that were all going to bandy together, that was a time. That was a time that they could have made a significant argument of, hey, we are risking, we don't, go back to April of 2020. We don't know what risks we are putting ourselves at. We don't know what the long-term effects of contracting COVID are and what the CDC is advising us. And we are going to go and we're like one of the only sports that is going to be going live. Why, why were they so able to pre present cards from the UFC and WWE? You didn't have a union in the middle of things to be, uh, to be pulling back or to withhold uh, services during this time period. But I mean, they went through and the UFC soared during the pandemic and these companies did, they didn't lose a penny of their television rights deals during um, that period. And it just wasn't, it's just something that is foreign to, I think the idea of kind of a, a group collective coming together for something like that, that could make meaningful changes. And I just, I'll believe it when I see it. I would love to see it happen, but I just do not have faith that we are going to see on either side of pro wrestling or MMA, that kind of formation of an association. Good. So we, uh, you can go again and, uh, and check out uh, the Pollock and Thurston show from, from Wednesday on, on that note, let's move on over to Ronda Rousey, who is about to embark on what's going to be a very noteworthy book tour. Her book, our fight is coming out in a couple of weeks it's like next week or the following week um i should be getting a review copy of this any day now so i've not had a chance to read the book but i will be and it sounds based on the excerpts that have been released and then this interview that she did she's writing this book with her sister who is a journalist maria burns ortiz and the two worked on her first book back in 2015 and this is going to heavily cover her time in wwe it's going to focus on her previously undisclosed concussion issues that she had going back to judo and withholding information throughout her career about concussions and such. And it sounds like she is going scorched earth on the WWE culture and in particular Vince McMahon, John Laurinaitis and Bruce Pritchard. And not surprising um, given that tweet a couple of weeks back about Bruce Pritchard and being Vince's avatar and yeah, if I'm Bruce Pritchard, let, let's be clear. Bruce Pritchard has not been accused of anything. Um, not not two names, though, you care to be linked with um, when you're talking about Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis in this current climate and news cycle. Certainly not. Some of the comments that Rhonda had um, that we do have up on the story was asked about um, kind of rivalries in MMA and how legitimate they were. And she did say, I originally just started them for publicity. But those other bitches did not get the memo, and so they became personal. And in WWE, it's all fake. I love them. Except for Bruce Pritchard and John Laurinaitis. They can go fuck themselves. That's real. And when asked like where she held back in the book, the only thing that really held me back was the number of words I was allowed to have in this book. We were contractually held to 9,000 words, and I was going to talk so much 90. more shit. Nine? 
9, says, words. It says 90 in this quote, at least. Okay. I copied something else. 90,000 okay. words. Yeah. 9,000 would have been a very quick read. Mm -hmm. um, 90,000 words. And I was going to talk so much more shit, especially about John Laurinaitis and Bruce Pritchard. But our editor said we had to streamline everything and not take a detour uh, on the fuck these old bastards quest. Maybe that should be the name of the book tour. The <laughs> fuck the old bastards quest. So there was a lot more to it, but I had to basically get down to the meat and potatoes in this. So, I mean, th this certainly sounds like this will be the selling feature of the book is a prominent name that is going to, you know, when it, when it comes to people in the industry getting a lot of attention for their book releases, uh, Ronda Rousey is going to get a lot of attention. I think it is extra powerful that this is also coming from a female in the WWE and that the fact is this is we have talked about the amount of people within the industry that have sort of kept the distance from this news story and speaking out. And it's going to come down to people that have no illusions of going back to WWE in the case of Ronda or people that just do not care in the sense of Bret Hart. Um, but yeah, this is going to be very interesting about how deep she goes in because she is not just painting like isolated incidents here. Like she is talking about an entire culture when it comes to the way women have been presented, talking about like uh, casting couch culture and even like bringing up Saudi Arabia, that is going to get pushback from Rhonda, who was somebody that right before that Crown Jewel event, right in the wake of the Jamal Khashoggi murder, um, defended WWE, stating it would be the wrong move to not go to Saudi Arabia. Um, but that also does underline, like when you are in the company and kind of towing the company not line, it's just now we... We clearly see these. This was not something that I think Rhonda had much conviction with back in 2018, or at least not now. Well, I'm curious to see if she answers that directly in the book or in any of these media interviews following. Um, I, I think it has been pointed out how it might seem on the surface kind of hypocritical that she would be so you know critical of the WWE now that she's outside of it, yet was willing to accept that paycheck for years. Um, seemingly had nothing really bad to say. Well, uh, while while she was with the company, is this simply capitalizing on, you know, a very anti Vince McMahon, anti Bruce Pritchard, anti John Laurinaitis sort of news cycle, um, or does she truly feel these things? I think she has at least some of that to answer for. Is it fair to, because that is how this is going to be painted of somebody mm -hmm. that we like when you are in the company, um, people are not going to uh, jeopardize their standing in this company. And I think that there is at least some understanding that people have to, like it does kind of just show this industry that you have to be pretty much removed from it before you can feel comfortable enough to speak openly about it. Um, but yeah, there is going to be like some criticism here. I'm not gonna go as hard on someone that opted not to say this stuff while in the company. But I also don't think Rhonda is um, the type of, um pro wrestler that would have had no choice about not going to Saudi Arabia. You know, yeah, plenty absolutely. of people have chosen and, not and, to. And go. to be fair, like maybe that those were her views in, in 2018. But I mean, in, in this statement, it it's hard sometimes, or where is it? Pay-per-views held in major cities like New York, LA, and Philadelphia, as well as now twice a year in Saudi Arabia, a nation that restricts the rights of women in a way that I'm certain Vince McMahon wishes he could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is going to be a very interesting read of uh, all the wrestling books coming out. And it'll also be interesting that you're going to have both uh, Ronda Rousey and Becky Lynch um, with these books and on book tours at the same time. And I think you're going to get very different um, experiences in WWE. And you're going to see the counter of somebody that is in the WWE system and is presented very well. And someone who is now out of the system. And just based on these excerpts, I mean, maybe there is some positives that she has of her time in WWE, but of what we have seen, it's a very negative portrayal of the company. And yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it's a prominent, it's a prominent woman that is speaking about a culture that is very much under the microscope of its treatment of women, uh, in its entire history. And positive or negative, um, both could be valid, you know, experiences. Becky Lynch has, uh, at least in her comments about everything that's been going on, um, has said that she's had nothing but positive experiences with, with experiences with the WWE, and I'm assuming including with Vince McMahon as well. That could be the truth. Um, and what Ronda Rousey is going to say in her book could also be the truth as well. But um, 
Uh, we never got that singles match between these two, um, but now we're, we're going to get a. Uh, this is the head to head match. The head to head. WrestleMania yeah. season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could this one join your MCU book on your Kindle? Yes, absolutely. I'm interested in both of them. I'll give you my copy when I'm done, actually. I'll, I'll, I think I'll have a hard copy of it. Sure. Thank you. Yoda Suji won the New Japan Cup on Wednesday morning, defeating Hiroki Goto uh, in Nagata. And I thought that this match, um, you know, it, it heavily leaned on the story that we talked about with Goto going in and dedicating this tournament to his father and wanting to bring the championship to him, uh, like, you know, uh, in his memory. And the closing moments of this, I, I thought they had, um, you know, the audience really got into this and it was highlighted by Goto attempting a Rainmaker, which Yoda Suji had scouted, met, um, countered it with the Gene Blaster and Goto's sort of... Um, Silver lining here was he became the first person to kick out of the Gene Blaster, but then the follow-up Gene Blaster. You can't you can't thwart two Gene Blasters, mm -hmm. and Yoda Suji got the win. I thought this was the outcome they should have gone with. I think in another time, another era, um, Goto winning could have been the right move. I don't think the timing was right for this, even with such a heavy story. Um, and then Yoda Suji proclaiming that he will be the face of New Japan, but he has one more thing to do and called in his stablemate Tetsuya Naito as they had the stare down and Naito asking, are you ready for this? To headline Sumo Hall, which they will do on April the 6th, which at least it's a quiet day in pro wrestling. Like New Japan will have all the attention of the pro wrestling world on uh, April 6th. Nothing else going on that night or day. It's going to be a very busy weekend in, in pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one might slip through the cracks, I'm I'm thinking. And we will go through the whole card, which they have announced for Sakura Genesis. But where you got to see the final, and wh what did you think about um, the performance by both and going with Yoda Suji to win? I thought it was like a good, like substantial, you know, New Japan long main event, um, 20 plus minute main event. And uh, mm, I'm... I'm more interested in what's to come afterwards for Yoda Suji, especially with him proclaiming that like this could be the start of some sort of new era. It really does feel like they're making an effort to make him like the focus star that um, I think maybe should have been the, the, the decision earlier on this year um, rather than now where when it kind of feels like they're just kind of, you know, scrambling to, to make a new guy with with the exit of uh, uh, Okada. Um, I I thought Goto did really well in this role, um, but it, it did come across to me like this was, you know, maybe a spot meant for David Finley or somebody else, you know, who could have also benefited from maybe a bit more of a mm, uh, a push, you know, in that in that spot, because I don't think for a second I really bought into Goto uh, winning a new Japan Cup for the fourth time. Like what's what's what would be the point of that at this point? So um uh, but you know they 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 got to where they needed to go by the the end. Um, overall, my interest in New Japan is still going to be a bit lower. Uh, do you think they do the title change? I think they won't. I think this is going to be. I think they're going to really draw this out, and this is going to be Yoda Suji coming within like closing distance of beating Naito, but ultimately falling to him. And I don't know if that's the right idea at the moment. There's part of me that thinks, man, just do something shocking to just sort of give New Japan this big shot in the arm with someone new and something different. And this idea that this guy is representative of the new, the post Okada New Japan, and this begins our new era. Um, I, I, I could make a very strong argument for that. I mean, Naito is Naito to me. Um, I think it would be kind of going with your pat hand at this point, but my sense is that Naito will keep the title and they're going to have a lengthier reign with, you know, kind of the, you know, Ghetto loves these long-term stories and failure along the road until you finally get that big win with the idea that it's built, it's it's the Cody story. It's the, the struggle is what makes the prize that much more enticing for the audience to get into the chase but I don't know if we have that long road at the moment when it comes to the audience that is investing in things. And I think the audience is craving a new scene, new players, and just different in the next generation. And Naito kind of represents like that last generation that they're moving past. And Suji represents that like he is front and center as the new face. 
I could see them wanting to keep the belt on Naito for a bit longer just to kind of, you know, maybe get all the way to Power Struggle just to have a few more Naito-led main events. At the same time, I mean, I don't know if Suji should be that sort of underdog like type of, you know, mm, have several attempts before winning the championship type of type of guys. Like, I think he could be just a dominant champion, you know, the, the way an Okada was booked, just coming in there, winning it. Um, now this would, I guess, be his second title opportunity. Um, I, I, uh, but, but because of the LIJ connection, I could see there being more of a long term story before he actually does beat Naito for it. So that's going to headline Sakura Genesis. The rest of the card has Evil defending the Never Open Weight Championship against Shingo Takagi. Shota Umino and John Moxley coming over from AEW will take on Jack Perry and Ren Narita. So we will not have John Moxley involved in any WrestleMania weekend festivities, nor was it after he was not announced for Bloodsport. I think most assumed he would not be doing anything. Sho and Yo for the Junior Heavyweight Championship. Kenta and Chase Owens defend the tag titles against former tag champions Yoshihashi and Hiroki Goto. Junior heavyweight tag title three-way match with the Bullet Club War Dogs of Drula Maloney and Clark Connors defending against Francesco Akira and TJP and Kushida and Kevin Knight. And I think Kevin Knight has just been, he's been doing really great in Impact. I think he is, he is not a finished product yet, but man, he has made some vast improvements. And I, I see this guy doing really well th this year in the industry. Uh, Doki, Yuya Yui, Muran, Sonata will take on Great Okan, Jeff, Okab, uh, Jeff Cobb, and Callum Newman. Bushi and Hiromu Takahashi against Ghetto and David Finley. And then Zack Sabre Jr., Kosei Fujita against El Desperado and Ryusuke Taguchi. The pre-show yeah. for Stand and Deliver, which is the pre-show for WrestleMania Night 1. Yeah, no, busy day on April 6th. Nothing's really jumping out to me at all. I'm 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 interested in, in the sort of um result of the main event, but beyond that. Um, I'll, I'll be waiting to see what people talk about that, that they might recommend. Um, it's not really a card in a, in a roster, even that really jumps out to me at the moment. Ratings notes. We go back to collision on Saturday, the live episode that did 393,000 viewers and a 0.12 in the demo. Uh, they were up against a ton of not just, uh, NCAA college men's basketball, but also the NBA that night and it seemed that their younger audience was very much hurt by the sports competition uh their 18 to 34 number fell 58 percent this week to the lowest mark collision has ever drawn including a 65 percent drop in women and 54 percent drop in men from the prior week which was a tape show it's worth noting however 35 to 49 grew uh, 30 to 32 percent, all because of men being up this week. Uh, the overall viewership was only down eight percent, demo was down four percent. And in Canada, so what they have been doing in uh, for those outside of the country, whenever uh, collision airs on the TSN plus streaming service, except when they do shows from Canada and then TSN puts them on television, but for this one, they delayed it and it was going to air at midnight Eastern time, so um four hours uh, delayed from the U.S. Uh, broadcast. However, um, the programming that was on TSN2 went late. So this did not start till 12.45 a.m. on late Saturday night, and they managed to draw 21,000 viewers at 12.45 a.m., which is not, not, the wor not the worst number for a show that was uh, delayed by 45 minutes, uh, which was already on a four-hour delay from the audience being out there so you had some very dedicated canadian viewers at 12 45 in the morning that wanted to watch danielson and shibata but i would say especially with its younger viewers this um this did not uh really engage them at that point you're just catching people who are watching whatever was what you know was, was on the channel before that right it's kind of a meaningless number when when it's that infrequent oh the canadian one yes absolutely Raw on Monday did 1,687,000 viewers at a 0.55 in, in relation to what they've been doing. As Brandon with Thurston say, WWE Raw drew a perfectly normal number. Um, the peak was uh, Cody Rhodes and Paul Heyman with uh, 1,960,000 viewers. That was the peak in both viewership and the demo. Second to uh, second was Seth and Drew's segment. So um, all these talking segments, it's... It's not just talking segments. It's talking segments with stars. Mm -hmm. Those are the those are the big movers at this stage. And Cody and Seth and Drew were big movers on Monday night in that regard. But in Canada, this show did 
404,300 viewers, the largest Canadian audience since the night after WrestleMania last April, uh, up 41% from last week, the number one sports program on Monday night in Canada, ahead of three NBA games, ahead of an NHL game, but bigger than that, they beat curling on Monday night. So wow. um, a juggernaut on, on raw that like that, that's a huge number. And I would not say this was a raw that, um, going in had a huge lineup uh, attached to it. Like it was a, you know, it's it's a lead up to WrestleMania um, promotion, but that, that that was a great number that they drew. Yeah, uh, off the strength of their full time talent alone. I mean, maybe you can credit uh, Becky Lynch and Nia for some of that, just given the, like you know they were the the main promoted thing heading into the show. Uh, they main main event at the show, but I mean, it's the strength of the Cody program. It's the strength of um even the Rollins and Drew program did really well in the quarters, and also even Sammy and Gunther, what they had going on was really really strong as well, or at least gained people. So, um, everything, especially on Raw, is really firing right now. Maybe the go home raw, nothing but promos. Three hours of talking. I don't think, well, I mean, you can't have G that. Give The Rock an hour. <laughs> he could do it. But, but a promo heavy, like, yeah. go home show, I think that actually should be the norm. You know, one of my favorite go home shows was, was the pandemic year when they were going into Mania mm -hmm. and they had no fans. And that raw before Mania, they focused just on great go home promos and they were very non WWE like in that they didn't have to play to the crowd. They would look at the camera. And I just remember that being a really entertaining show. Uh, one that I will never go back and watch, but I do remember at the time thinking it was a, a very good go home show. And the last number is NXT on Tuesday, 569,000 viewers and a 0.18 in the demo. So the demo was up 12%, but the audience fell 3%. So that does make it the lowest audience since 4th of July last week. But, um, there was very good growth for that main event and in particular the overrun with Noam Dar and Trick Williams, including a 13% gain um, in in both for the uh, the overrun and especially a growth in 18 to 49. So I, I would say certainly the Trick Williams, uh, you're, you're seeing him really elevate himself as the star of this brand going into stand and deliver, even though overall viewership for NXT, it's really subsided since like the, mm. the peak several months back. Um, and we are getting less of the crossover, but you do have this breakout star in Trick Williams that does feel, it does make you wonder, like the fact that this is a non-title program with Carmelo Hayes, like what are the plans for Trick post stand and deliver? And are does he stay on the brand or are they taking inventory of all of this and realizing we we don't need this guy in NXT for another six months? It's he, he will be one of the more interesting people to watch post mania. It's the type of question uh, or, or situation where you'd ask, could they directly translate this feud between Carmelo and Trick uh, from NXT directly to the main roster? C is that possible? Can they? That would be uh, our first feud call up. Yeah, yeah. Like, can they accurately convey to uh, an audience that might not have, you know, been keeping up the entire time with NXT the entire history of these two? Or will they choose to space out their appearances? I mean, we haven't seen Carmelo on the main roster for quite a while, but I mean, last we saw, he really was a baby face, like in, in any of his main roster appearances. So do you translate that character directly? Uh, and if not, I think that would probably more so mean Trick would stay on NXT. Or let's remember, you can split them up into different rosters as well. Yeah, I mean, you always bring up the point about trying to introduce people in the lead up to Mania and how tricky it is. And I think they've seen that like Carmelo is, you're right, like more designated towards NXT. And I would say even Braun Breaker at this point, like they've kind of, he's been on a couple of SmackDowns and they did the signing deal. But I mean, he's, he kind of feels like he's just going to be a post Mania project. Uh, mm. Like, I don't even know if he gets on to, to Mania. Like, it seems like he's focused on stand and deliver. Yeah, and at this point, I, I think we um, can rightly say there's really no Brock Lesnar um, uh, rumors or, or even suggestions that he, no. he would be on, on WrestleMania. No. So uh, that would have been the only spot I could have seen a Braun Breaker perhaps attach himself to, you know, besides maybe Gunther. And now we know that that's not that. So I, I like the idea that they're trying to make Stan and Deliver feel like it's you know, it, it's, it should be a big deal in and of itself just to even get on stand and deliver. And that could be those guys' WrestleManias, and then you start off fresh for a, an entire year with a Braun Breaker or, or any of these other call-ups. If I was Baron Corbin, I'd be like, you know what? 
I just don't know if Braun's ready. You know, I, I think he should stick around in NXT. This yeah. has been great for Baron. This is Corbin's on his best run easily. Mm-hmm. Like these two have a great chemistry together. Their matches are like th- these are the best matches Corbin's been involved with. Um, like I, they certainly have more legs in this team. It's just Braun Breaker. They may have more loftier plans for him. Yeah. All right, all of your news can be found postwrestling.com. Again, we had a pair of guests on Pollock and Thurston, not just Eric McGregor, but also Todd Martin from the Pro Wrestling Torch site uh, joining us. Always great to catch up with those two individuals. And later today on the Post Wrestling Cafe, we will have Karen Peterson and Bruce Lord running through the New Japan Cup. They'll also be uh, going through the highlights of the Cinderella tournament and Hanan winning that tournament on Wednesday and some of the other news and notes going on in the Japanese industry. Friday night, we are back with Rewind to SmackDown, and then no collision course this weekend because no collision. And then um, what else do we have coming up this weekend? We also have uh, Postmarks dropping on Sunday. We have the return of MCU later, where WH and Rich will be talking about X-Men 97. I've seen Ooh. the first episode. It is fucking awesome. Okay, so uh, if, if you're uh, if you're somebody who may might, might have just had their 40th birthday, there's a great chance you're you're going to love this because it, it was probably made directly for people like us. Um, so they'll be doing that show actually on the free feed. So uh, sample the first episode. They'll be t- talking about um, the first two episodes of X-Men 97 right now. And then you can listen to the rest of the Post Wrestling Cafe beginning next week. OK, check that out with the great rich fan at WH Park. On to Dynamite slash Rampage from Wednesday night at the Coca-Cola Coliseum in Toronto. Russell Tick's late last announcement was 6,278 tickets distributed. So they did promote this as a sellout. And the, the amount that was listed as in the building for the first Dynamite they ran in the building in October 2022 was 7,500 um, with about 7,100 paid uh, per the observer. So it would seem... I mean, we were inside of the arena and mm-hmm. like the capacity set up like this thing was full. Um, yeah. I don't know if the set, the, the new set is a bit larger. There were also some, you know, behind the set of sections that were, you know, not available. Um, but I mean, from the seats available, I mean, it looked pretty damn full um, by the time Dynamite started. If you're doing the eye check, it looked pretty, pretty much a legitimate sellout to me. Um it's hard to know, I suppose, you know, if they could be off by a few hundred based off of the size of set or I don't know, whatever else. I told um, Braden to count. He hasn't gotten back to me yet. I wanted him to okay. do a go, just go seat by seat and check, hmm. ask yeah. people for their tickets, make sure they were paid. What were comps? Um, but just a, a lovely venue for professional wrestling. You know, um, we've we've seen them go to the Scotiabank Arena. And and I mean, it's it's a pr- it, when it when appropriate for something like a forbidden door. It's great for that. But man, for yeah, I think in the Coca-Cola Coliseum, there's really not a bad seat in the house uh, other than what Hansi had. He, Hansi got tickets very late and he ended up w- with a ticket behind the curtain almost. <laughs> like So his view was somewhat obstructed. But if you were able to get anywhere, even in the farthest rows, like it's a it's a great great looking venue and and i'm sure it looked great on well it did look great on tv as well i thought yeah it's um you know it was a very hot crowd it did translate on on television and out comes mercedes monet to start off and we not only got to hear from mercedes monet but you got to see her as well in toronto so we learned uh it was an appearance you you will i mean i think we now can uh determine we'll hear from Means a live appearance. I think we have to assume that because they advertised uh, we'll hear from Will Ospreay as well. And he was also there. So Mercedes goes over last week's arrival. She's still on a high from it. And she is not here to lead a women's evolution. I already did that. But a global women's revolution. And she was busy over the past week editing her own highlight video. And we go to this package of you know her post WWE run with highlights from New Japan, Stardom. Uh, runways in Paris, walking the red carpet, and even her Mandalorian um, involvement as well. Something I don't think was ever mentioned in her WWE tenure. Um, yeah, not to my knowledge, uh, or at least like not not fully not promoted like this. Um, yeah, they might have not even mentioned it at all. Interestingly, the fact that she like set this up with here's a video I made of my it came up so heelish to me, like. <laughs> Look at my 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 own highlight video. I just thought it was like you go to this video and it would just be 
Like to me, it would be something that it's a little thing of maybe Shivani teased this up. Like, let's take a look. At but your- but but listen, the, the boss character and certainly the CEO character is certainly um, not somebody known for their um, humility. You know, it's it's the type of like Ric Flair type of, um, uh, you know, cockiness uh, about and confidence that I think we admire even in a baby face. Well, she also mentions the injury that all of the she was on this great role, but then it was all stopped by this injury at the hands of Willow Nightingale and they have unfinished business and anyone who messes with me is going to end up bankrupt. So the lights go out and Tony Schiavone notes something is happening. We can hear it. And then the lights come on and Julia Hart is in the aisle as Sky Blue tries to jump her, but gets stopped. Hart runs into the ring, lands a boot, and then the moneymaker gets stopped as Sky Blue saves Julia Hart. The heels grab chairs, and that is when Willow Nightingale and Statlander run down to back up Monet. The lights go out again as Hart and Blue disappear, and as Sky, or sorry, as Mercedes turns around, she sees Willow holding the chair up as if she is going to attack Monet from behind. And Willow just puts down the chair like she's been caught, and Mercedes says, "You were going to strike me." And Willow just stands there, and she doesn't deny it. And Monet just says, "I'm watching you," and that mm-hmm. begins our. Um, friction between Mercedes Monet and Willow Nightingale and probably the dynasty match. Uh, per- yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, something you, you sense immediately seeing Mercedes Monet come out is that like her presence is incredible. It's great on screen, but in person, I mean, with that theme song with like the robe and like the incredible outfits, like it's completely undeniable in person. And that alone, I think, makes her like live up to, you know, the expectations that and the hype. Um, I like that they're continuing to give her time on the microphone. For one thing, it delays, you know, the, the matchup, of course. But I think it also gives like necessary reps for a Mercedes Monet, who I, I, I think continues to need to improve on the microphone. And it's still the weakest part of her game. But I think she did well here, you know, in conveying um, her story, throwing to the video package. Interestingly, interestingly enough, I don't specifically remember the spot where she injured herself but they don't show the point of injury. And I know like in her interviews, she, she's been talking as recently as last week that she's never even watched it. I wonder if that was done just maybe out of respect or maybe what, like, was it, was the spot even attribute attributable to, to Willow? She was on like the turnbuckle and then just came down and just like landed all of her weight on it. Right. So it wasn't even necessarily something Willow caused, although in story, they're trying to tell you that Willow did, did cause it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I do feel they should probably at some point like show the spot. I mean, it is a big part of the story, but you can also get away with just, you know, she was injured. Everyone knows she was injured. The time to show it would have been now, I feel like, you know, when you're trying to tell people the, the fact that they're glossing over it. I mean, maybe it, it's as simple as, you know, Willow didn't wasn't really involved in, in this when we're trying to sell sell people in this feud, right? Um, They're teasing Willow turning our Mercedes and, you know, we don't really have any motivation from Willow about why she would um, possibly do that and that they might continue to convey that but the more likely result in all of this is Mercedes attacking Willow um, and Mercedes maybe turning you know fill, filling a more much more natural role for her in, in being a heel against somebody who in Willow could never ever really turn tough. heel yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Marvez is with the elite I, I'm really starting to enjoy Marvez as the yeah. go-to interviewer here for the elite and he does introduce Okada by his full name, but then the Bucks say, that's good. But next time, say it in his native language of Japanese. So I cannot wait for this man to attempt some Japanese in the future. Well, his name is being said in, in Japanese. They, they, but they I want think they him... want the full introduction to be in Japanese. Exactly. They want Marvez to, to speak English. And this allowed um, Matt Jack Matthew to very, again, obnoxiously remind us of his Duolingo streak, which is currently at 165 days. And he's crushing it, he says. Um, and even demonstrates by saying uh, "mizu onegaishimas," which uh, means "water, please." And uh, he's so proud of this. <laughs> there's not <laughs> sixty-five days. What a what an endorsement for this app. There's a like there's something so incredibly like heelish and obnoxious about somebody bragging about their duo lingo streak that Matt has very um, effectively tapped into for this heel character. So the Bucks note that they can't be ringside for a continental title match, but we will be your match producers. We're going to catch all your replays. And it ends with Okada stating, I'm coming for your title. 
and they keep it short and sweet with Okada, and this works perfectly. The dynamic is is they're figuring it out, and, and, and especially for Okada in presenting him as like a substantial part of the show without having to speak substantially in English, it's effective. They showed him at the beginning of this show, of course, uh, coming out of the Ferrari, and uh, it, Ferrari, by the way, that um, the, we all walked past, you know, heading into the the building. It's just parked like right outside of the building. Yeah, we're like, oh, who's, whose car is that? Um, it turns out it was uh, Okada's. Anyway, so th they're making him look like a star uh, just by simply, you know, presenting him in these these sort of fashions, and um, it's effective so far. Yeah, all the new additions, Okada, Osprey, and Mercedes Monet, all got huge reactions. Like I would, mm -hmm. I would state the three of them and Copeland were. I mean, you can just like they to me were the the, the four major stars on this show to to the audience. Yeah. And with that, Okada's music plays and he comes out giant roar for his entrance. And we get the Continental Championship match challenging Eddie Kingston. And Kingston takes a DDT on the floor. And we cut to the back where the Bucks are producing the match alongside Tony Khan and applauding this DDT. Oh, great looking. Did, did they physically cut to themselves? Like when we go to the back, like they must be making that, that cut, right? This might be part of the uh, invisible camera that. Um... They are slowly maybe introducing in convenient you're, you're right. You're right. Tony. Kingston yeah. uh, fires back with chops, hits this double overhook suplex, and then hits an STO on Okada, sliding forearm for a two count, and then lands the Urican, but Okada kicks out, and he hits a spinning version of the Rainmaker, and Kingston gets his arms up to block it, and this injures uh, the forearm of Okada. And the crowd is chanting for both back and forth throughout this. Uh, Kingston tries for a half and half, and then Okada stops it by grabbing Paul Turner and then rakes the eyes of Kingston, ducks the Urican, slams down Kingston, and then just lifts him up by the wrist, hits the Rainmaker, and you get a, well, with the eye rake, close to a clean finish here. 15 minutes, 52 seconds, and Okada wins the Continental Championship, and we do have the fracturing of the Continental Crown. Um, in speaking to people that um, I, I ran into or in and around the arena, I was most people curious. People or person? People. Okay. Multiple people I, I asked about this because I was most curious about people's reactions to this particular match, Eddie Kingston versus Kazuchika Kizu Okada. It was certainly a good match, and just by listening to the crowd reactions, I mean, they were massive throughout the entire thing. But if you had high expectations for this one on the level of, you know, the best Okada matches or even the best Eddie Kingston matches, I could see why some would leave disappointed. Um, because this was not a pay-per-view Okada match. This was a made-for-TV format heel Okada match. And I, I, I ultimately like felt like that was the m main interest for me coming uh, watching this match is to see how Okada would be able to adapt to TV format. Yes, I know on Fight TV at NordVPN.com slash post wrestling, you can watch without commercials, but they do f wrestle like it's a commercial break. You know, you're getting even a rear chin lock from Okada uh, throughout. So the wrestling in this match differently. They're also not doing like the ramp up sort of like major, like climactic finish um, sequences like you would see in a New Japan match. Um, and I think all of that was is done because maybe for conservation, just because this is a TV match, not a pay-per-view match for that. You have to pay for Okada to see that. Uh, and also they wanted to get over the um, the Rainmaker as just a very devastating one hit move that doesn't require, you know, multiple kickouts to, to, to finish. Um, but beyond that, I think as a heel, Okada displayed like a lot of differences from his usual uh, wrestling style um for one thing he was playing cowardly heel at times you know like letting the letting eddie chase him around the ring um something that really stood out to me was just his new reliance on facial expressions which i think are are, are great you know he has a great cocky like laugh that he's utilizing a whole lot more um and just like I find find him to be like, you know, at least a, a lot more interesting to watch now simply based off of facial expressions when in the past watching him in New Japan, I, I think he'd always been a bit more stoic in in at least, you know, that department. Yeah, I rewatched this match and I, I enjoyed this. I thought Eddie Kingston in particular, was, I thought he was great in, in his role of making this like a, a significant um obstacle for okada i thought they did i like the finish where it just came out of nowhere where you really established this rainmaker as this move that is going to um all you needed what was the one here um yeah like I, I i don't know i didn't have too many uh complaints about this match and this crowd like sometimes when you're in the building 
you might like amplify like how well it comes off. They were they were red hot for th- this match throughout. I mean, they saw mm-hmm. both guys as big stars, not just Okada. They saw Eddie Kingston as an equal. Um, and yeah, um, it's kind of more uh, another title in the mix. Although I wonder how much the ROH and New Japan Strong titles are really going to be in circulation on AEW proper. Like this, the Continental title is going to be the title, but it is, again, a, a further... And I guess we'll see if Kingston stays with the ROH title after Supercard of Honor, if they move that onward. But this gets Okada into a prominent position to continue. Like, it's a it's a solid person to have as the follow-up as this champion. And then the direction is Pac, who comes out and stares down Okada, and that looks to be the the first title program for Okada. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not really too like, you know, upset about like these titles being split at this point. It's like I I think it was the Triple Crown was a neat gimmick for the tournament and spe- spe- specifically for Eddie Kingston. Um, but I think long term, maybe we we should have always expected them to be split eventually, especially for something like a New Japan Strong that belongs in in a completely different company. I wouldn't expect to see that title, especially, but maybe even the ROH title recognized that much on AEW television, other than when it's being held by you know somebody who who frequently appears in in AEW. Um, but it's you know it, it we, i i just i don't I, I don't get that bothered by it it's just you know it's another thing and having uh the continental on 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 okada i'm assuming this might be tony's way of giving okada like a long title run to first of all establish the continental crown and also to uh promote major matches they do they are running into like a case where i mean it works for maybe some of us but man imagine a new viewer coming in and you've got to keep track of the internet international title. You've got to keep track of the continental title. And we're just talking about AEW championships at this point, not even including ROH and all the other ones. Um, TBS or TNT. I mean, like there's oh. like four men's championships alone. And what what really distinguishes each of them? What the fact that like you can't have people be out for ring, ringside, you know, like, is that enough to justify a brand new title? Yeah, that could have been a like just a unilateral ruling for yeah. title matches, but it's yeah. specific to to this one. Well, it's the continent, okay? The continent is at stake, and this is our ruler of the continent. The so this is the North American Championship. Um, I guess, yeah. No, what is the international championship then? Well, he wanted, um, yeah, um, you know, someone's got to someone's got to oversee Mexico, Canada, the U.S., and that's Okada. But but continental. I guess it's not the intercontinental. It's only within the continent. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's what the, the international and, title will take care of the other continents. And so the TNT championship, is that only defended on? Should that only be defended on TNT? Only the cable homes to TNT is available in. So it's it's oh, okay. less influential over the last year, probably 5% less than last year. <laughs> so it should never be defended in Canada like we saw because we don't get TNT. No, no. Then it should only stream. Uh, or right. or they should ha- they should really they should have made a TSN title for this main event. Maybe they could just tape a match and then stream it in the building for people to watch. But you have to pay to watch this this mm-hmm. this title defense. Okada looks good with the championship. Let's give him one. That's basically what this comes down to. Renee is with Swerve and said Joe tried to embarrass him by choking him out, but I have my own history of choking people out with this chain, and I've been inspired by watching Mike Tyson uh, working out for his next fight. So I want to have my own sparring session with an open challenge tonight. So his Jake Paul would turn out to be the butcher. Yes. Mm-hmm. Interchangeable parts. Then uh, Willow and Statlander are interviewed and Willow will have had more f- street fights than any woman in AEW after tonight. And it all ends tonight with Julia Hart and Sky Blue. Monet walks in thanking Chris Statlander and says it's nice to meet her. But then when she gets to Willow, she just cuts off Willow stating you've done enough and leaves. Some reminds Willow that you broke her ankle. Yes. Some good follow up here on the Willow Mer- Mercedes history. Um, they are playing that, you know, Stokely can't even get Mercedes attention. But I mean, you could you could definitely see Stokely and Mercedes being attached at some point during this AEW run, maybe even as soon as the end of this feud. Non-title match between Hook and Chris Jericho. This seemed to be a 
a nod to the famous Brock Lesnar, John Cena match where immediately Hook suplexes Jericho and he is teasing like he's got a stinger and he's grabbing his neck and Hook is backing off and they continue and Hook starts just going at him with strikes in the corner and Jericho's trying to get in chops and then it's one German after another by Hook and they really space these out to try and milk as much reaction out of each successive suplex to display the impact of each one and Jericho it did a very good job I thought of selling these suplexes and how dangerous hooks uh, suplexes are and the crowd starts chanting for, for one more and suplex city and the final German gets the loudest reaction and Excalibur is calling this a lopsided match Jericho finally gets in some offense with a lion salt and he goes for a throw and hook doesn't rotate which appeared mm. to be the goal and just comes down on his face, which is better than coming down on his head. But this looked a little nasty and he gets the red rum. Jericho breaks the grip, gets on top with ground and pound. And when he goes for the walls, hook catches him with an inside cradle, pinning Jericho in 1054. And Tony Schiavone mentions that hook has beaten Jericho. And this was only hooks 55th match compared to Chris Jericho's 2,769th match. So a bit of experience disparity for Jericho. And that Jericho has Jericho was the first AEW champion. They really tried to put this over as a significant win for Hook. And then they fist bumped afterwards. And Jericho backstage telling Renee that Hook earned his respect. And next week he will have a proposition for Hook. Mm -hmm. mm. So um so first of all, it was a very entertaining match just to see Jericho thrown around and um, memorable for that reason because it kind of gave the match a singular theme. The crowd was very engaged throughout it all. Um, and it was a very giving match for from Jericho, taking a bunch of suplexes and then pretty much taking a clean loss here from Hook. Perhaps there's some want to continue to, you know, show people that, especially naysayers, that he's here in AEW to elevate younger talent. Um, I think he certainly takes a lot of pride in being that guy on the roster or at least thinking of himself as that guy on the roster um but at this point it's almost you know we saw we've seen with action andretti we've seen with like whoever else has been in a similar situation it, it's it's a lot more than just one win that might help elevate somebody it's sustained level of push um that that could get somebody there and we'll see if they can achieve that with hook i'll, I'll also say this did not feel like that big of an upset because we've seen Jericho, you know, lose to an action Andretti um, or Takeshita, you know, and, and those wins um, kind of being maybe remembered just as their own without any lasting effect on like how we it, might view. It's somebody. why I argue the opposite. Like people are complaining about like Jericho takes up so much um, space on the show and that he works with all these talents. And my argument is like, I think he's like overcompensating with how often he loses and instead it should be when he loses that it has the maximum amount of impact instead of that that thought that you have of like you have seen all of these losses and 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 it doesn't have that shock factor like mm -hmm. the andretti one did the andretti one certainly did mm -hmm. um but no follow-up I was impressed here in the in the sense that uh, number one, it was like Jericho coming out to White Zombie instead of um, instead of Judas, and like he's been not, doing, like he's been doing for Lionheart. Um, it's not yeah. like you had a you know pro Canadian Jericho crowd either. Like they took mm -hmm. to Hook as you know the the dominant figure in this match, and th they got the reaction they would have wanted that this match was tailor made to have. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, how could you have a guy throw somebody else around for like, I don't know, 10, 10 times and, and, and not want to cheer them. I, I can't see this feud ending with anything, but Jericho turning on hook. I mean, Jericho has really been fighting these heel reactions for quite some time now, even before whatever, like, you know, the, the, all the Kylie Ray, like attached controversy. Um, this match felt like it was made for Jericho to get booed even in Toronto. And we'll see what this proposition might entail. There was another story time video with Adam Cole. Um, he's disappointed in Wardlow's loss to Samoa Joe last week. You had one job and then says, I should, I mean, you should be champion right now. And now Wardlow, your job is to keep the international title on Roderick Strong and the ROH tag titles on Matt Taven and Mike Bennett. I want you to reach your full potential. So don't screw this up. The positive of this is that I think Adam Cole in these segments is coming off much more of the, 
sort of this villain heel role that they have envisioned for him and less like the um, just sidekick manager that he has felt like in the Undisputed Kingdom. Um, but we are kind of retreading the same, you know, Wardlow, the indentured servant here mm -hmm. under the thumb of Adam Cole and the Undisputed Kingdom. Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure part of it is because um, that was Wardlow's most successful run as you know the underling uh, the oppressed you know um uh, uh, muscle behind mjf um so to see if we can recapture against some of that magic for for wardlow this guy um, has some bad trust issues man like <laughs> so that maybe the interesting wrinkle for this one is that it it could be very possible that this time mjf comes to wardlow's rescue and the former oppressor kind of becomes you know okay. his his new best friend and we might even get a Wardlow MJF team now as baby faces, which would be an interesting way of reintroducing MJF and maybe even an introducing and MJF hires Wardlow and he promises to take care of his family as well in this tag team. Uh, maybe maybe Wardlow hires MJF, who's now because of inactivity lost all his money. Maybe he had some bad, bad investments in the stock market and now Wardlow actually has uh, made some great investments. You know, maybe Wardlow he... says, yes, you know what? How about we file an antitrust suit? <laughs> Um. That, yeah, it'll come out that he he had a prior MMA experience, and I, I'm sorry, the, the last person who is antitrust is Wardlow. He has too much <laughs> trust, as we have established. Right. Very good. But I could I could see MJF, you know, kind of rolling himself into. I, I, I don't mind that idea at all. I I actually like that that mm -hmm. as a as a possibility. Tony Schiavone brings out Will Osprey. I mean, I think I'm as much enjoying like Osprey interview segments now yeah. as much as like matches. Like mm -hmm. he came out and phenomenal reaction they bring up forbidden door Two. the last time they were in toronto and osprey acknowledges he was a very naughty boy back then and he apologizes to canada i've changed i'm here for the betterment of aew and i'm going to give you some of the best matches but in exchange canada i want some of your maple syrup and he says that people should go back and study brian danielson and shibata from collision and said afterwards danielson's words he said in one breath that he was grateful to be facing will osprey but in the other breath said that Osprey couldn't walk in my shoes. And Osprey says, maybe you're right. Because in Japan, you know, Danielson, where you wanted to be a big star. I got to Japan, saw your shoes, and you're right. I couldn't walk in them because I looked at your shoes and said, they're too small, bruv. And this place just thought this was the mm, greatest awesome. line. And he said, Danielson, what you did in Japan was great, but what I did was elevate pro wrestling and goes over all the belts he's won and all the changes um, that he has gone through. And now I've got a point to prove, and therefore I'm challenging the man you just beat, Katsuyori Shibata, who I lost to in 2017, and that's going to take place next week in Quebec City. And um, again, this guy continues to feel like the biggest star on this show that had quite a lot of them on this show. But I felt this guy was just um, this was another tremendous segment with Will Ospreay. And these segments to me are doing more than yeah, the more. matches need to be like that is the given. Mm -hmm. It's these that are to me solidifying this guy as the, the baby face to build this promotion around this year. Yeah, I mean, it really is the difference between, you know, somebody who could uh, wrestle a five star level match versus somebody who could be a star, especially when you're talking about North American television, you know, where we're so accustomed to not just watching wrestling, but knowing the personalities behind it. And uh, you could definitely make an argument that this in AEW, you certainly have to be able to wrestle. That's the key to success, you know, ultimately for everybody. But you also know have to uh, you also have to know how to talk. And of the three new signees, um, you're kind of seeing varying levels of like, you know, uh, aptitude on the microphone. You're talking about Okada, who's not a native English speaker, who I think is finding his footing with what he's able to do. You have Mercedes Mer uh, Monet, who is mm, passable, I would say at best, but I don't think she's ever been a great promo, anybody would say. And now you have Will Ospreay, who I would say is a great promo. OK, like maybe the week one would have been like, hey, like that was really well done. Was it a fluke? You saw enough here in week two to say that that was certainly not a fluke. This man possesses some real abilities and real charisma that Tons. I 
like that 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 feels like it's he's been doing this for decades you know and he he's probably been cutting promos like you know uh, uh, certainly backstage in new japan or like yet yeah, at other independent promotions his entire life but doing it on 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 live television with your time cues in in, in a fashion that's as compact as this is a different level and he showed so much like charisma and ability to control this crowd um made people laugh effortlessly with his jokes like he was the rock here you know came across to like such a veteran no wasted breath no wasted words and was so in incredibly endearing here as a baby face to a Can canadian audience um really strong energy and just a really 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 great promo a great segment from will osprey so you're gonna get that uh that, that match with shibata next week in Quebec City. I'm curious how how this appearance does for him at at um, nine o'clock. Um, how how did uh, the Osprey segment do last month? Do you remember off the top of your head? Because I know there was some disappointment off of like the Fletcher um, main event. Um, but how much of that is is you know just kind of down to that particular night um, versus you know in, in either case like they are pushing this guy like he's a big star and i think certainly buzz coming off of these speaking appearances uh, it will be enough to, to keep this uh a very sort of sustained you know uh, momentum so, so yeah so last week it was the crossover segment at nine o'clock when osprey did his promo and it did grow the audience from the previous quarter by eight percent in viewership and grew 12 percent in the demo but that also included uh, Deanna backstage and the start of Jay White and Darby Allen. Cause the Osprey promo, what would you say was like five to six minutes mm -hmm. of, of yeah. that 15 minute quarter. So, I mean, it, it was in a very advantageous segment and they put him in the same segment this week. Like that crossover typically does pretty well and no ad break as, as well. That helps. Where would you slot the Shibata match next week? Next week. Um, is it's it a strong enough it, attraction for a main event for if you're trying to maximize ratings or do you of do the you lineup we have now? Yes, you have. They've announced three matches with Swerve and Takeshita. That's not headlining, and the Young Bucks and Private Party that I could see in the opener. But we'll see what else they add as well. Like you could do a. It's, a, it's an incredible looking show. It's a week. pretty strong show for Quebec City next uh, next week. Tony Storm and Mariah May against Diana Perrazzo and Thunder Rosa. Um, this one, it was very glaring. Like the audience just, they saw one team as the baby faces and one team as the heels and they are not the way that they are portrayed on television. I mean, it just very much felt mm -hmm. um, opposites. Uh, it was bizarre world here in Toronto, but not so bizarre because I think everyone sees the opposites. Um, Taz started complaining at Luther who was yelling at him during a picture in pictures. Like he's not even on camera. Um, May starts choking Thunder Rosa from the corner. They're working over her and then May yanks Diana from the apron and the tag is made to Diana, and she's trying for the Venus de Milo. All four women get involved. And then there's a German suplex by Storm onto Thunder Rosa and lands the most vicious hip attack to Thunder Rosa. Goes for the Storm Zero, but it's countered, and Thunder Rosa pins Storm with the jackknife cover. And Diana is looking surprised here that Thunder Rosa has just pinned Tony Storm. She's not celebrating the win. They go seven minutes and 11 seconds and would seem to insert thunder rosa into the title picture and diana and thunder rosa maybe they're gonna have those two have to meet each other in an eliminator match or mm -hmm. something like that but that seems to be where we were coming out of this but good reaction to, to tony storm not overwhelming like um some of the other stars on the show but she did feel like the standout among the four here. Well, it felt like this was a like I think a pretty successful effort in in putting Thunder Rosa into the the the, the title mix on on Dynamite. Um, I I could see three way potentially as well between Storm and and Rosa and Perazzo. Um, or it could be a straight up transition, you know, for um uh, uh, uh Tony Storm's next challenger, but. I thought the crowd really liked Thunder Rosa and reacted really well to her. She just has like this sort of like look and, and presence that makes her immediately over, even even though she might not have been on, you know, like had too much substantial to do on TV over the, over the past year or so. Um, I think a singles match between Storm and Rosa is definitely a more attractive like pay-per-view level match. But um, I do, I just hope like Perazzo doesn't just get lost, you know, back in the shuffle after she's out of the title mix. Swerve Strickland and The Butcher in a open challenge uh very loud chance for swerve and pretty much just a 
an ability to put Swerve on TV here. Uh, Butcher kicked at his shoulder, hit a backbreaker from a half Nelson, and then Swerve comes back. Kawada kicks, house call, and Swerve stomp, but then introduces a modified short arm scissor, cranks on the arm, and submits the Butcher in three minutes and 23 seconds. So adding that to the toolbox. Yeah, like almost maybe like a bicep slicer here you know seeing a big guy like um butcher immediately tapping to a move like this does a i, I think at least a pretty decent job of like quickly establishing it as, as a big move for sort here good little match i think butcher is great you know heavy looking offense and just good to see him on tv look. Even i just i love the guy's look um mm -hmm. as well it, it, it is worth noting like i think that swerve needs to win a few matches with this because there was pretty much no reaction for this, but you're well, this is the you, first you, time you used it. It's the first time. And yeah. this will probably be the case for several, but this kind of reaction, when a guy instantly taps mm -hmm. by match number six, you'll, you'll see the difference. And the yeah. goal would be have a very viable submission. Once you're ready for the Joe match, he needs a, he needs a clever name. Um, the, uh, give me some time. You're putting me yeah. on the spot. I'm sure I can come up with something awful. Swerve addresses Samoa Joe, says he has he used to have nothing but respect for Joe. Now I'm close to hating you. So he hasn't crossed the line yet, doesn't hate the man yet, just strongly dislikes him and has his chain around his neck, said this is for Joe, but Joe's neck is too big. I need more of a chain. And he'll continue to take out security until he gets what he wants. Joe is out, reminds him, I beat you at Revolution and you need to go down the, down the ladder. I guess ladder is now interchangeable with rankings. And insults the people for now believing in swerve and he's going to give swerve exactly what he wants but before he what he uh before he gets to state what that is he's interrupted by don Callis, who you could barely hear from all of the booze but says that swerve and Takeshita have the same amount of wins but Takeshita is undefeated outside of the don Callis family because yes osprey is still a heel in the don Callis family by loose association at this point so he wants them to have a match swerve agrees and that will happen next week to Keshta and Swerve. The um, the reaction to Don Callis was crazy. Like you, you, we we couldn't hear. I anything. heard nothing. I had to rewatch this to hear even what he said. Yeah, and they're not piping in the sound either. It's just like it's just the whole arena that's just like very very loud. So, uh, Swerve and Takeshita is is a great looking match. Um, they have so much talent that like even their setup matches for pay per view like feel very very big so I, i'm guessing some sort of chain match for for joe and and swerve at dynasty it seems to be um where they're going with uh, you know the idea of like choking each other out you're introducing submissions um a choke you know, out only match um yeah maybe a um a st louis chain match <laughs> st louis okay those those vicious <laughs> st louis chains and then we have the main event, um, the I quit match for the TNT title between Christian Cage and Adam Copeland. They they had Adam Copeland do quite a lot of media in the last 48 hours in the lead up to this, uh, worth noting. And I mean, th this crowd, they're going nuts before the bell even rings. They see this as a really big match. And immediately Copeland teases the spear, but Cage rolls oh, out. Of let's the ring. also mention the uh, Alter Bridge sing along we had. Yeah, they came out and the music ended. And the crowd just kept doing, they didn't get to sing Judas. So they sang Metalingus. Yes. Imagine yes. coming home and explaining to someone that doesn't watch wrestling. What, what did you sing along? Oh, we sang this song called Metalingus. Mm. And uh, it, it was a cool like environment for this. And I actually liked the way Christian's music cut off the sing along. And it was like the crowd was sad that they had to stop singing because of this prick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they fight into the crowd, into the penalty box, and they do this spot where Copeland puts a Boston Bruins jersey onto Christian, and then Copeland grabs a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey to put on, and they do the hockey fight spot that gets a big reaction and a go Leafs go chant. And what did you think of the choice of a, a Bruins jersey here as the uh, heel? So I would give strong assumption that this was a um, conveniently placed set of fans with these of jerseys. Course. Yeah, um, of course. Which would lead me to believe why go with Boston? Well, okay. So I, I guess original six team, maybe a classic rival. Obviously, the the main rival of the city would be the Canadi Canadians, um, uh, Montreal. And second, Ottawa, I would say. Yeah, but I guess you wouldn't want to heel edge in those territories for the future. 
and and so thus um where, where did we go last week boston that's the furthest we're <laughs> we won't be going back to boston for months they won't remember that that's exactly i mean we're, we're really overthinking this it was i'm great. sure there was thought put into it i mean you know i'm sure they were considering other teams but no let's go with boston so i mean the crowd really got into this and yeah. uh even like a bit of an assist by Christian, like feeding the arm into this, into the, didn't want it to be too, uh, it's sort of an automatic know. reaction. Like I, I have to dress Oscar like every morning and you just Dude, you kind of learn. I was literally thinking uh, as I do, like, it's yeah. almost second nature to have to like put a yeah. child into a shirt. Like, uh, I, I think I could have done this seamlessly. So, um, there was a funny part. In and the and just a note here from Jared, who says the fans with jerseys were a couple of Ottawa area wrestlers, Dexter doom and Cecil Nix. Okay. Those names are so made up that I'm not even going to need to fact check. I, I I believe you, Jerry. Yeah, no relation to Jasmine Nix in NXT or Dexter Loomis. Uh, that we know of. Yeah, Dexter Loomis, the man. Um, We, we don't know where he is. So they um, Taz starts talking about the Toronto Maple Leafs, and then Excalibur explains that the Toronto Marlies play here. Um, Taz has never heard of the Toronto Marlies, and Excalibur tried to explain <laughs> them, and God bless <laughs> they make their way into it. Cage runs into the women's washroom. So these women come running out of the washroom. As, and and uh, this is all during commercial. Okay. This was yeah. during the commercial. And they come back into the ring and the ladder is brought out. We get a TLC chant. And then uh, Copeland goes to place the ladder between the ring and the apron. And or, sorry, the apron and the barricade. And this ladder is too short. So it looks like he had to improvise and he places it between the desk and the timekeeper's area and then drops Cage on top of this, just taking the back bump onto the chair or onto the ladder and then sets up a table against the barricade, can't spear Cage through it. And then Cage sends Edge Copeland into the post and uh, Copeland starts bleeding. And then there's a high cross that puts both men through the table on the floor. Back into the ring we go, and Cage gets out of a cross face with an eye gouge, and they do a double spear spot that sets up the second commercial break, and they make their way up to the stage. Cage gets catapulted off the stage and then thrown into a hockey net that Copeland brings out. First time we've seen a hockey net, I think, incorporated into a AEW match that I'm aware of. Hmm. Yeah, you're um, heavy okay. leaning on the on the hockey. Um, they were aiming to get on to uh, TSN Sports Center. Maybe an inter interview with Jay on right. That was it. Yes, yes. Yeah. They were uh, they they were looking for their their highlight pack that huh. Mercedes Monet could edit and and send over to TSN. Shayna Wayne shows up and hits Copeland from behind with a hockey stick to the balls, but Copeland still won't quit. Then the hockey stick gets broken over his back, and Cage is driving the hockey stick into the throat of copeland and he's gurgling but he won't quit so cage brings out a bunch of chairs including a barbed wire one and copeland gets out of the way of a concerto and both attempt kill switches onto the barbed wire chair and they're thwarted cope uses the cross face with the hockey stick but realizes cage can't say anything with the hockey stick in his mouth so instead takes the drawstring from his tights and uses it to choke cage this is when Nick Wayne and Killswitch run out to assist Christian and Shayna comes in slapping Copeland and that prompts Matt Menard and Daniel Garcia to run down and Killswitch is the one to take an impaler DDT onto the barbed wire chair. And then, I don't know how close you saw this, Nick Wayne gets thrown over the top and his heel comes down and just rocks kill switch in the head and wow. he came down i thought this guy was like going to be knocked out from this it and looked that, brutal and that's um, after taking the barbed wire that's after the barbed DDT. wire and then menard is literally grabbing them up to take the high cross from copeland off the ladder and uh and Jeez. that was all for kill switch as him and nick wayne get handcuffed in the corner and then they handcuff cage in the other corner Shayna runs to the back and copeland just kicks this dude multiple times in the balls and you knew where this was going to culminate. It was the reveal of Spike. And, dude, for all the um, the introduction of this Spike and then the promo on Saturday, like, there were some signs for this Spike. And this crowd popped when he brought this thing out. I thought they did a pretty good job of building to this ultra weapon of Adam Copeland's. And he hits Cage in the balls with this thing and then goes to hit him in the face. And that's when Cage quits in 25 minutes and 46 seconds as Adam Copeland becomes a two time TNT 
slash TSN champion. And they did do the transition to Rampage in between the final of, of, of the match. So you had to switch over to Rampage. Um, or if you're watching this on, on, on demand or something, you have to stick around through to Rampage officially in order to catch the finish of the match. Um, you know, it was getting to a point there at the end where like Christian was like refusing to give up based like off of like a lot of shit or I almost was worried he was becoming a little bit of a baby face here. Like the man took like multiple ball shots, to the balls and just all this other damage and still wouldn't give up. That's going to be the story. He will not be able to father any more children. That's pro probably exactly it. Yeah. I thought this was a great match. This was my match of the night crowd was incredibly into it from the beginning and they managed to deliver like a really captivating sort of series of chapters throughout the, the entire body of this match a lot of variety and creativity even their brawling through the crowd at the beginning i thought was a lot of fun with that hockey fight uh and then the introduction of the tlc weapons leading to a lot of very creative spots uh, for two people who really kind of built their careers off of these gimmicks I think they did a really great job, like you said, of introducing Spike earlier on. Uh, the moment it showed up, got a great reaction. This was a finish that felt very conclusive, you know, after the cuffs, after the repeated shots to the balls. Um, there's really not much more where they could go, I feel. Listen, I, they've had two singles matches in AEW, this and the World's End one, and I think both have been outstanding. Um, you can flip a coin of which one you prefer. I, I, I love that match in de December. I thought it was tremendous, and this followed up on it really effectively. To your point, I think this feels like the end of the program. And it, like this audience was great for the entire 25 plus minutes. They were into it. And yeah, like the people I was talking to after, like everyone uh, seemed to be raving about this. I thought it was like a really, really strong television main event that you got like this was a pay-per-view level match that, mm -hmm. that you uh got out of these two it could and have been the match we would have had at revolution but i i think you know at this point you really want to spread the wealth and there is probably not a better place they could have had this match than mm -hmm. in toronto yeah and they, they also had the match in montreal as well back in december so those are the locations that we've had so three matches at this point and that bleeds into Rampage, which I thought... So, after so, so let's maybe finish talking about just Copeland and, and Cage. Where do you think they move to next? Um, I think with Copeland, you're... I really like the involvement of Daniel Garcia and to a lesser extent, Matt Menard in this uh, as well, that you kind of have them as sort of, you know, Copeland's like, you know... The new edge heads. The new edge heads and um, the... the uh, the cope, cope? Uh, I don't know. I have no hmm. idea. Yeah. Tougher ones. Huh. Um, you know, I, I could see Copeland continuing the, the, the open challenge deal that mm -hmm. he had been introducing as a challenger and now doing it as a champion. Yeah. Um, but I think everyone like, dude, he's mentioned it. Like there's just an endless amount of names he's never worked with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, take your pick of where you go next. Um, I think he can definitely get away. Like, I don't think kill switch or Nick Wayne are the, the people you go to at this point um and i'm also interested to see like where where cage goes after this if he's like off for a while and then returns at some point um wh where that goes but yeah i mean it's it, it's not like anything's been hinted at for for copeland so i think it's just like an open book of just different uh options you have for him like just kind of you know throw a random like <laughs> draw a random name on, on the AEW roster. I mean, it'll probably be interesting. There's so many guys that are fresh opponents for him. I think, um, you know, and this TNT title run for, for Christian has really, really been amazing way achieved. I think way more than any of us could have expected. Uh, but now as a baby face, we're going to see a much more active, you know, title title defending champion. Um, that'll probably stay on collision the way he has. Um, but, you know, you have a lot of potentially big headlining matches just for those weeks of collision. So I was very curious to see what the retention would be of the crowd into Rampage. And I've got to say, like, there were a very small handful of people leaving after this match. But it was, I would say, like 90% of the people stuck around for Rampage afterward. Like, it was a pretty full building by the time we got into um, the next series of matches. It looked good, yeah. Especially with the way they they bled the last segment to to this one. Um, th there was a really healthy, like, yeah. I want. I'm gonna say like 85 to and up. You know, it looked really healthy. 86.3 percent, <laughs> which would slowly dissipate as we got through rampage. 
Yeah, they had to clean up this entire ring. So we first had a tape video from Jay White and the guns that are not in Toronto and are at a pool and basically justifying their turn on the acclaim. They never needed them. Jay White has now taken Darby's bat that was handed down from Sting and made it a golden bat and said he saved Darby's life by breaking his foot because now he won't climb Mount Everest and that I am bigger than Everest. And I hope we just get Mount J as sort of his uh, his new moniker. Hmm. And then they had this skeleton go down the water slide that they called Darby. We come back, the acclaim come out, and Max Caster tells them to stop the music. And this was a very audible, disappointed crowd that were not getting a rap. And instead, you were getting a serious promo from Bowens and Caster. And I'm curious to see if they are going to slowly try to get away from the rap uh, at, at this point, or if this was a one-off. Like, they, hmm. they needed to do a serious promo here coming off the turn. I don't think this called for a rap. So th this was a yeah. little, um, you know risky segment for the act that you associate with you know getting like a part of the show with the max caster rap um i did think max caster was a little out of his element here having to cut a serious promo um you know he ran down jay white being a fake tough guy and he's going to send them back to new zealand england or new japan and then went on and on and why he's a stupid person and then bowens took over said jay jay white is not elite enough they ran a video package on all the tag champions, but excluded the guns. Jay White, you should have listened to the internet and signed somewhere else. You lost in the Continental Classic, and you lost in a title match to MJF, who had one leg. You should stop blaming everyone else and blame yourself. You're a coward, and we're counting down the days until we beat your ass silly. And said to turn the camera around, because this is the only gang we need, as they referred to the crowd. Asked them to put the scissors up. And put down one finger to show Jay White and the guns what you think of them. Um, I thought Bowens was tremendous here in particular. Very, very good promo from Bowens here. Uh, fired up, just like passionate. And um, he's always, I think, been shown like to be the better promo of the group, certainly. But like um, somebody who's just become, I think, a really good promo period, you know, among this roster. So really, really strong. I mean, all teams need to get serious at some point. And um Maybe, maybe the pay per view, maybe you save the rap for pay per views only. Yeah. You know? I mean, it was not the smoothest. Like when they got John Cena, like there was a point where mm -hmm. they had to drop the rap with him. And it was, it was awkward because you so associated his talking with the rap that it was very hard. And obviously, like in time, like you just think of the rap character as such a small bit of his um, history. But I mean, that transition was, you know, one that you were going to have to go through kind of a re-education of your audience to see him as something more than just like the Mark Wahlberg knockoff. Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta against Powerhouse Hobbs and Kyle Fletcher. This is the second of two wild card matches in the tag title tournament. I, I thought this match was um, really strong. I, I enjoyed this a lot. The winners will face Taven and Bennett in the next round and Hobbs immediately hits Orange Cassidy with the spine buster and that, uh, sets up Cassidy selling his back for the whole match. He was put in a torture rack by Hobbs. Trent is constantly making the save. He again got thrown into the LED board by Hobbs, steps on the back, and then they come back, double stomp into a beach break by Trent and Cassidy onto Hobbs on the floor. Fletcher then ducks the orange punch to hit a spinning tombstone, and Fletcher is busted from the mouth. Trent hits a half and half to Fletcher off the top turnbuckle, and then after a diving DDT off the top, Cassidy hits the orange punch to pin Fletcher in 10 minutes and 31 seconds. Very good match. Yeah, really, really good um, match in ring. I I don't know if um, I I personally had as much engagement with it in terms of character dynamics or story. I mean, this was, you know, more just about getting into the tournament. So um, Hobbs and Fletcher, great team. You know, I don't know if they teamed before this as a, as a duo, but like already felt like a team I wanted to see again. Yeah. I mean, this, um, this sets up Cassidy and Beretta now against Taven and Bennett. And I think, you know, the further they go, I think this could be where Trent, um, yeah, you, you introduce, are they going to do the split with Trent? This would be the tournament to do it. If you are going that direction, I guess and, it's, it's been so long. I, I don't know if I even care that much anymore. So at this point, um, I had not seen any of the graphics for Rampage beyond the street fight and this wild card match. So at this point, we are like three hours in and uh, I went to the bathroom and I came back, walked into the arena. And there in front of me is Katsuyori Shibata hitting a PK 
onto Kevin Matthews. And mm-hmm. I just look away. I'm like, what the hell? And uh, Shibata was on this card and had a very quick match with Kevin Matthews, who Matt Menard regarded as big bastard, this Kevin Matthews. And Shibata <laughs> um, suplexed him, got out of a... Uh, Kevin Matthews tried for a choke. It was turned into a rear naked choke and PK for the win in a minute 24. Mm -hmm. It's cool to just get a random Shibata jobber match, you know? And um, like normally, I guess in years past, like a role like this would have been reserved for, uh, I don't know, like Otis or something like, like, you know, somebody like, like buried deep underneath the card. Now that this roster is so deep, your setup guy for Osprey versus Danielson is Katsuyori Shibata. And here's a random Shibata match just to kind of help us pad out his record before he loses to Will Osprey next week. Um, I'm, I mean, should he have a bigger role? Maybe you could debate it, but I mean, I'm grateful that, you know, we at least get to see Shibata um, even in a role like this. And then we went to the craziest party. <laughs> Adam Copeland celebrating with Daniel Garcia, Top Flight, Andretti, and the best friends. And this was like the most, uh, <laughs> what a party this Wild. looked like. These these guys should have been making their way to Sneaky D's by this point. Um, yes, yes, maybe. Um, maybe they could do Metalingus together. <laughs> could you imagine that if he, uh, yeah, if, if Daniel Garcia had showed up at uh, Sneaky D's. Kanosuke, Kanosuke Takeshita against Rocky Romero. Um, they went eight minutes, 54 seconds. Um, the key part here was Takeshita missing a forearm smash and nailing the post. And he was selling this arm for the rest of the match, which Romero snapped and worked over. Uh, Callis distracts Bryce Rumsberg. That allows Takeshita to nail a big boot and then blocks a slice bread and hits the bastard driver, blue thunder bomb. And then after a big lariat stops Romero, he hits the rolling elbow and Falcon arrow to get the win and we'll face swerve next week, but it looks like they're going to tease like his arm is uh, injured from this post spot. Mm. Very good match. You know, a lot of fun watching Takeshi to throw uh, the smaller Rocky Romero around Rocky worked his ass off and received some pretty good reactions. I felt, you know, from especially he was getting chance from the crowd, yeah. like this late in the show. And then we had the street fight main event. And I thought these four were in such a tough position. It is following that I quit match from like 40 minutes prior. It's the last match of Rampage. And when the four came out, when they started, like they were not starting from a high point from a audience engagement level. But mm-hmm. I thought the four worked really hard. And by the end, they really did turn this crowd um, and, and got into them. Because I think sometimes uh, like a street fight, you might think, well, this is like a shortcut to really get this crowd going. I would say uh, this late in the show, I think it's so tough when you're watching one of these hardcore matches and they're not getting a reaction. I find it's like, it's such a hole to get out of. It just feels like it's so disappointing. Um, Mm -hmm. But they just, you know, they worked really hard. And I I thought this was like very impressive by the end of things. So yeah, at this point in the show, I I would say uh, you could definitely notice more like empty patches throughout the arena. Um, so I don't know, I would say maybe 67.5% of the crowd might've stayed by this point. I had 68, three, but we'll split the difference. Yeah. So Julia Hart got placed through a chair and they just like threw her around in this chair. A backbreaker um, to her with her inserted inside a chair. Yeah. Then Julia Hart got a spike, not Adam Copeland's spike, but a just individual spike and missed Chris Statlander and nailed Sky Blue in the head with this. So this caused Sky Blue to start bleeding. Tables were set up on the floor. Chris then suplexed Sky Blue onto a seated chair. And that seemed to be where the crowd was like, oh man, this these women are killing each other. And so the crowd is picking up at this point. Willow and Blue end up on this just the AEW broadcast desk is just like another monster. Okay. And it's a tank. Willow goes for a power bomb and it's turned into a code blue. And dude, this desk did not flinch. See, I don't even know if it's supposed to break. Has it broken this announced desk um, in the past? I don't know. I, I I don't keep tabs on table breaks, but um, this this is a reinforced desk. I, I would want if, if this is not designed to break, I would maybe save my spots then for something that's going to generate that um, that smash. I mean, you can argue this would was a bigger reaction because it didn't break. Mm-hmm. Blue brings out a bag of tacks. So Chris 
Statlander brings out her own bag of tacks and they fight on the turnbuckle, cheeky Nando's kick, and then Chris Statlander's shirt is pulled up and she is dropped onto these thumbtacks. Then Sky Blue places the tacks into Chris's mouth and super kicks her for a two count. Blue is climbing up the turnbuckle when Willow returns and hits her with a DVD off the apron through both tables. Chris is left alone with Julia Hart, dumps her on a pile of chairs, and then climbs to the top. Statlander misses a 450, wiping out on the sea of chairs, and Heartless is applied. Statlander submits, and the heels get the win. A really solid victory here for Julia Hart. Um, Not doing the idea of like setting up a challenger here for Julia Hart, but instead just giving her like the big decisive win at the end, which this was also kind of built up as the end of this feud involving the four, you know, Mm -hmm. Willow Nightingale's going off to Mercedes and we'll see where Statlander goes from here, but not the obvious uh, challenger set up for uh, Julia Hart. But I, by the end, like you had people like standing and applauding this. Um, They worked really hard and I thought they had the toughest position on this entire card. Totally, totally agree. Um, I can't imagine following the main event of of Dynamite with as much gimmicks as they were able to throw in there and the star power you had of Copeland and and Cage um, and then having people sit through another hour of wrestling and trying to deliver a similar type of match. But these four pulled it off. You know, they had some very big spots and got people's attention as a result. And um, I thought all four, like, had really great showings. You know, in AEW, these sort of street fights in the women's division are, they 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 typically turn out really well. Yeah. Um, everyone I talked to seemed to just love this show. I, I had a great time uh, watching this. I thought this was, like, a really strong rampage that followed um, – you know, I, I thought like you had a really, really excellent match in Copeland and Cage. Um, I thought this was like a really strong three hours and seemed to be a, a lot of people were very high in particular on the I quit match afterward from who I spoke with. I was really looking forward to this show just on paper um, more than like previous dynamites that have been in the city. And I thought it, it delivered in terms of content. Like, again, this roster is so deep now that you could potentially have a near pay-per-view level card on every single edition of Dynamite. And I think you're certainly going to see that next week. You know, it's like, it's just like, it's what you get when you have, you know, an Okada, Osprey, and Monet on a show. And you're not even relying on a Moxley or Danielson, you know. You have like a Shibata and Takeshita that could play like these sort of supporting roles, you know. Uh, it's 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 just i mean we're we're, see, we're seeing really good utilization i think of the, their new crop of stars and then um way and i made our way over to sticky d's for a surprising half price nacho night yeah we showed up and it was the bde poison runners uh unofficial AEW dynamite after par- after party i don't know uh, those flyers look pretty official to me uh, uh you know uh, a, a lot of uh wrestling karaoke was to be heard and the biggest surprise of all was half price nachos which if i had known i would have uh, helped promote maybe that much more because on wednesdays half price nachos at sneaky d's was a wonderful surprise when i got my bill yeah we got the whole run to half price wings on thursdays half price nachos on wednesday mm-hmm. so um there you have it sneaky d's folks college and bathurst uh, let us get into some feedback uh, to the show. Those that attended yeah. live or watched on television. Let's first of all, go to some super chats here. We go to one from Bluey who sends 200 rupees. Who says the difference between NXT and main rosters as big as it was five years ago, NXT's cartoonish skit base spot festy and ring like a comedic Lucha underground. The main roster is more grounded. The characters are night and day. Do you agree, John? Sorry, we're talking about, um, NXT and the main roster's differences from five years ago or now talking about now. Okay. They're um, saying he's saying that the difference is as big now as it was five years ago. Um, yeah, I, w- I would say there's some merit to that. I think that you largely have like NXT is very heavily character based. Um, mm-hmm. I don't dr- see that as a, as a huge negative either. Um, what you might be seeing is more of like sort of a refinement, um, of of those concepts on the main roster because you're talking about people with more experience the goal of nxt should be to give people experience so that they can get comfortable um you know Mm -hmm. playing characters period a lot of these guys you're talking about are are just you know college athletes that have never done any acting at all so yeah it's going to be a bit rough around the edges you're going to 
deal with a bit more sort of corny, like stereotypical characters. Um, but this is all done in an effort to eventually get them out of their shell so that when they go to the main roster, they might be able to give you a more refined performance. And um, it's a wider variance of the wrestling, too. Like you do have an Ilya Dragunov. You also have way like you have some people mm -hmm. that have literally had under 10 matches total yeah. in their career, some even lower than that. I much pref much prefer this than what it was five years ago when you had NXT be the more realistic, grounded, you know, um, uh, product, and then they go to, go to the main roster and they play these cartoon types. I mean, that there was a disconnect there that made no sense. Uh, Plethora sends a super chat to say, "Does the Ali Act die if Trump wins presidency?" Uh, it probably would be a lot, lot tougher for the Ali Act to um, cross over to MMA under a Trump presidency um it would seem very uh, unlikely under that administration and and why specifically um because that is ultimately going to be like you are going to need heavy re republican support for such a change i i would go so far as to say even under the biden administration i think it's it's still going to be a tough um act to cross and and you know, th this was passed in 2000, applying to boxing. So you really have to have the people that are going to back this and, and and take it all the way to be able to enact that kind of change. And listen, the UFC puts in, they have a lot of lobbying efforts. Like they do not want to see the Ali Act applied to mixed martial arts and impacting their business. Um, so I, I would say like, yeah, it's probably a tougher um initiative under a, a, a Trump administration, but I don't see it as some like given, uh, if it's if it's a democratic uh administration either that you're going to see these changes i'm just i'm just not very optimistic that you're going to be seeing that change but could be Greg, gregory mclean just sends one in five dollars thank you for the super tag gregory he says thoughts on mox and claudio not being in the tag title tournament i don't know what's up with mox because he hasn't been like we know he's announced for sakura genesis but we haven't seen him on tv for a few weeks so i mean there could be some quiet issue going on with moxley we don't know it's one of those could be just, that he's just finally taking some time off maybe maybe he's gone fishing i mean it could be like i i don't think they're just oh we forgot about moxley and claudio i'm sure there's a valid reason for it and the fact we haven't seen moxley on tv for a few weeks i mean would would add up that um, yeah when you know he's scheduled for april 6 which is not that far away when you're talking about the field of these tournaments i mean you, everybody is going to have to lose except for the the final team at the end right and mm -hmm. and maybe that part of that is under consideration too if that's you have no the, if they're not putting the titles on them it like i think aew they're very sensitive about like we're not going to beat an act or an individual if we don't have to and that could also like yeah you have claudio there but i think even claudio they they want to be semi protected and it's also like you know we have only so many spaces we have a lot of tag teams that are dying for airtime you have like a team like the infantry that you know it looks like they're trying to use this tournament to, to to turn into something um and and so what's the point of putting the bcc there when you already have two stars right other than to be able to say we're putting the best tag teams in this um we know that's not really the case you know they're not putting the very top ranked teams they're they're putting the teams that they want to feature all right, let's go to forum.postwrestling.com for some of your written feedback from our Post Wrestling Cafe patrons. I'll start off, John, from Benjamin, who says, some of the TV audio was polluted by some loudmouth trying to scream over Mercedes Monet. I hope he wasn't being gross. Um, I couldn't hear it. so I couldn't either. No. Yeah, uh, Toronto showed up tonight. Good work to everyone that braved that awkward TTC route to the arena. I like that AEW is trying some new production techniques out, like cutting to Renee during Kingston's entrance and cutting to the Bucks and Gorilla during the match. The hockey fight and the jerseys were hilarious. Um, yeah, I mean, the spot got over really well in the yeah. equip match with the, the jerseys. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Next, we go to uh, Muggin. The I Quit match and women's street fight were what stood out on both shows. Copeland and Cage can move on from this program despite some overlooked near the tail end. Some oh, overbooking over near the tail end. The handcuffs finish was genius. I almost expected that Mercy, Monet for those scoring at home, was going to do a run-in during <laughs> the street fight. But that feud and Willow is loading up. The AEW airing both shows back-to-back, -back, a sign of them moving Rampage to Wednesdays. Well, I guess the ratings will will maybe determine if there's anything to that. Um, I I think been... this was an experiment on their part of just the idea of a three hour block. And I would yeah. say that if their audience is like, listen, this should this is probably going to be um, the biggest number that Rampage does um, with the lead in of Dynamite attached to it, and also getting what like ten minutes of 
Copeland and Cage as an overrun slash first quarter for Rampage. So, yeah, I mean, but, they're, they're going to look at that and we'll see what the numbers are later today. But the idea of, yeah, the third hour is going to go down. But if we retain 70 percent of the audience, that's way more than what, you know, um, the programming at 10 Eastern on Wednesday night does in for a regular week is one week enough though to be able to say like it, this is a worthwhile venture because could it not happen where like it used to happen with raw or could happen with raw where um people would just start well tuning out later or maybe tuning in later uh if they know that they're going to get the bigger matches towards the end i don't know i mean tony has like has tony said much about like the show keeping the show two hours or, or turning it potentially into a three hour show. I mean, his initial view was opposed to three hours, but mm -hmm. I mean, these things can always change your yeah. perspective and what is offered to you. I mean, that to me is always going to be fluid. Super chat comes to us from mod revolve who says juice made a cameo in the BCG video wearing a hat. Yeah. I saw somebody in the chat room mention that. So he was apparently in the background and we're not just talking about, um, rock card juice board which mm -hmm. they were selling at at the merch table i mean they didn't have shirts for many people but they were selling the rock card juice board of which uh, many several people i saw in the crowd bought let's go to curtis next up writing this live on the go train home after one hell of a show a great main event by two hometown guys great action drama and use of canadian tropes and nice to see copeland with another great performance in his hometown after his last wwe match there Good to see the heels finally get their comeuppance. The Hook Jericho match really didn't do much for me. Hook did his best Lesnar impression with the Germans, but Jericho seemed off in the match. It feels like with all the AEW talent on the roster, he doesn't fit anymore, but not sure if Tony Khan would ever scale back his usage given how much Jericho meant to Khan when AEW first started up. Swerve and Osprey were the two most over guys in the building, and the future of AEW, a collision at Wembley, seems to be a long game for those two. Good Rampage, but not a fan of Rocky Romero taking most of the match with Takeshita. Felt like he could have used a dominant win over Rocky heading into next week. Overall, a fantastic show, high energy, and a great three hours of AEW. Um, Yeah, uh, on, on the Jericho front, um, he, he definitely has been struggling to, I think, find like a hit. Uh, in my opinion, you know, in, in, in several instances of um, feuds now, um, we'll see what this proposition is with Hook. I mean, I think it, it's it could be reforming the tag team, but I mean, I would have suggested that being a setup for the tag tournament, of which obviously they're they're not a part of. So, what could the proposition be? Maybe it's the heel turn that he needs that'll freshen things up for him. Um, FTW tag titles. Oh, yes, exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to Annie Rude, who says, I thought the show was a bit of a fall off from the heights of last episode. I was left wanting by o Eddie Okada, and I didn't think that match delivered to its potential. Hopefully, Eddie gets to come back down the line. Uh, feels like Will Ospreay is repeating the same thing on the mic just by using different analogies. I'll still have a nervous <laughs> breakdown when he drops Ryan on his, on his head with the Tiger Driver, though. Edge and Christian ruled. Unbelievable match. Um, yeah, I mean, dude, I, I can't say much negative about the Osprey, but like, like what is the purpose of a promo and the reaction that they got? And he directly guy... answered, like he, it's, it was a retort to Brian's uh, 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 insinuation that he couldn't fill his shoes. Yeah. And, and he expanded match, on that like, one line, like masterfully. I felt. Five minutes. I thought, I thought it was pretty effective for the segment. Cody from Maine, despite the live experience, hopefully you guys saw instances of AEW's continued effort in updating their presentation. For example, Renee's interview with Kingston's entrance, mm -hmm. different camera angles, etc. It's so refreshing to see the two biggest companies break away from the tired standards of how wrestling is supposed to be presented. Really fun main event. I hope Copeland continues with the Cope Open moving forward. Weekly defenses against younger guys who will gain so much more from as little as 10 minutes of ring time with him. On the other hand, there's Jericho. 2022 was one of the stronger years of his career, but that feels like a lifetime ago. Last year was a mixed bag at best that saw any optimism evaporate once the Kylie Ray allegations came to light. Um, I think we have to be careful about how that is, is couched in the sense that we don't have allegations from Kylie Ray. We have a post from her that certainly can you can read into, mm -hmm. but I think that is like dangerous territory to be just diving into things and is one of the reasons that I, I think people are somewhat um, handcuffed in how they can really judge that, that story in the, in the fullest when we don't have 
yeah. an allegation. It requires nuance to be able to explain now, set like a month removed, you know, rather than just simply saying Kylie Ray allegations. Like what, like what a better term be, what would you even like, you know, if you had to call it a thing, what would you even call it? Um, I mean, so is it a story? Is it controversy? Is it, you know, it's hard. It's difficult because we it's a, it's a weird story, period. Again, as I said at the time, to me, the response, if if AEW is seeing that that emoji response and let's say they have no knowledge of anything, um, there is a reaching out to Kylie Ray for context of what is meant here. Is there something to this? What was meant by that that post? And we don't we wouldn't know either way whether or not that would be the course of action or that that took place or or didn't. No, but that would be a natural follow up, would it not? Yes, yes. Um, but what do we do with that? You know, like we we don't know anything beyond what we know. Lastly, I'm very intrigued to see what happens within the world title picture over the next few months leading up to Wembley. Three weeks ago, Swerve was the most over guy in the company and the most popular choice to be the next world champion. I don't think he's either of those things anymore, having been surpassed by Will Ospreay. Does Swerve still get the title? Is it a four-month reign? If longer, what do they do with Ospreay? And how long do you hold off on putting him in the title mix? It's a good problem for AEW to have. I don't think Swerve has been replaced by Osprey. I think Swerve is still very much up there, and Osprey is just another person that's kind of in the weight. You know, like that's that's a big potential matchup that they have, may, maybe for a stage as big as All In. Um, I but I don't think he. I don't think you ever just because somebody like has a great couple sets of appearances. I don't think it 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 means that people don't want to see Swerve become champion. I Having an overabundance of super over baby faces is not. A problem in fact like a year ago we were talking about that as something that AEW is missing and mm. um and you have like mjf in the mix and you would think like he's coming back a as a baby face and will be in in that same position um on, and, on top and, of it and you got guys like page and you know kenny whenever he's he's healthy will come back i mean um danielson will see like how how active he remains but um yeah like mox claudio just i mean it's it's unbelievable the roster all right, lastly, let's go to Mr. Kane, who says, just a few thoughts. So, Hook beating Jericho should have meant more, but Chris Jericho has really fallen down in stock for a myriad of reasons. I can't get into it. It's really unfortunate. Um, I, I guess we're referencing uh, everything we were talking about. Um, Takeshita on Rampage again. Decent match against Romero, but why is Takeshita not getting the Dynamite or the Collision spots? Yes, I know not everybody cannot be on the B or A show, but Takeshita should be positioned to be a top-tier heel, ready to challenge any number of baby phases, not just Rampage Duty in a desperate attempt to draw a select few diehards. He's got the momentum from the Osprey match and the in-ring skills to keep him in the main shows. Feeding him to Swerve is almost a reaction to this very sentiment. However, Takeshita shouldn't just be a stopgap like Hook was. Keep him in the mix. Osprey on the mic is like printing money. I, I don't really see too much of a discernible difference between wrestling at, at 10 30 PM and wrestling at 9 30 PM on a, on a Wednesday night. Like, yeah, it's going to most likely be the lowest of the three hours, but I mean, it's also an hour that they were trying to uh, build up. Um, I, I guess I'm curious, like what, what, any, what you would sacrifice on dynamite on this edition of dynamite for Takeshita versus Rocky Romero match. You would have had like less than half the time and probably swap it with like Swerve and Butcher or something like that. Like that's probably the, the then slot. Then you would complain about Swerve not having a a, a match. Listen, it's more important to... for, for the title challenger to have a match than Takeshita. Yeah, like they had a strong match and he's set up for a really big match on Dynamite next week. Like there's, you know, I, I think Takeshita's in... Which he'll lose, um, very likely. Or maybe not. It could be non-finished. But I mean, you, you have your focuses for the pay-per-view that's coming up, right? And, yeah, and it's, I mean, like it, it, it's one thing like I do feel like people have to get their heads around is like, man, it's like we're a broken record of talking about like the depth that they have of all these talents and the idea of like, why aren't they pushing this guy or that guy? Like, dude, you have to just pick who are we building up for our title program? Who are setup guys? And that's not always going to align. And yeah, there's not going to be an emphasis at the moment on a powerhouse Hobbs. There's not going to be an emphasis this month on, on this guy or that guy. Um, that's just going to be the nature of the beast. Like you cannot 
just go up and down and say, we're pushing everybody. Like you have to make choices and you also can't just be doing um, this guy's the star and we're going to have him beat John Silver. Like you want to have substantive matches on television. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's going to require people that you're going to think deserve a higher standing. Like that's just the subjective nature of booking. Like you do have to have your, your push guys and your setup guys. And the hope of, of maybe that, that effect of like, you know, the top mix being so overcrowded is that maybe it would improve the stock of a, of a rampage. So that rampage might feel a bit more must see when you have, you know, constant appearances from your favorites in Takeshita and, and you know, who, who knows who else, right? That's the hope. Um, ultimately, it's going to come down to, I think, attractiveness of like the characters and the stories and how important they make rampage feel to like their overall, you know, storytelling okay thanks everyone for all the super chats all the feedback also want to thank all the various listeners and viewers that we got to see i ran into a ton of people on uh wednesday night so it was great uh if any of you came up to us uh said hello much appreciated as mm -hmm. always and supporting post wrestling but that's going to wrap things up we've gone nearly two hours here for a special thursday afternoon edition of rewinded dynamite again uh later today karen peterson and bruce lord will be up at postwrestlingcafe.com with a review of the new japan cup final uh the entire card and then friday night we are live right after smackdown featuring cody rhodes and roman reigns with no seconds beyond paul Heyman, who is not a physical threat to cody rhodes and um, probably preceded by um, a, a substantial profanity-laden uh, Dwayne Johnson promo on social media as well. Do you think we get one on Friday? I think so, don't you? It's a weekly occurrence at this point. But it usually coincides with an appearance that night. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe we'll get the Saturday morning reaction to the talking from the night. Before. Okay. We'll see. Maybe. All right. That's it for us. Uh, you can always go on to postwrestling.com or join us on board at postwrestlingcafe.com. Uh, we got some great responses to our review of Shimmer earlier this week, volume 68, which is up for all cafe members, as is a audio news update that went up on Wednesday as well with uh, my quick thoughts on the Terry Gordy episode of Dark Side of the Ring that aired on Tuesday night. So that's available, uh, that particular audio news update for all cafe members. And there is the Shimmer review featuring a fireball in the main event. I really enjoyed talking about Shimmer and just like, you know, getting an excuse to dive into this um, promotion that I've heard so much about, but haven't really seen a full show of up until um, this point. So uh, let us know what you guys think, you know, and, uh, um, you know, every rewind away is an excuse for us to, I guess, look into something that we might not otherwise talk about on these shows. All right. That's going to do it for us. Thanks to everyone for tuning in to Rewind to Dynamite.